Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, a really warm welcome to this uh, special uh, live stream event and online book launch uh, called Social Media in China. I'm really glad that you can join us today uh, for this online stream, uh, which launches two very, very special books. Uh, the book Social Media in Rural China, uh, written by me, and the book uh, Social Media in Industrial China, uh, written by Xin Yuan Wang. Uh, so just a quick introduction uh, for who's here today. Uh, my name is uh, Tom MacDonald. I'm an assistant professor at Hong Kong U University in the Department of Sociology. And I'm really, really, really delighted uh, to be joined today uh, by uh, Wang Xinyuan, or Xinyuan Wang, uh, who is a, a PhD student at University College London, uh, and also uh, really happy to be joined uh, by Professor Daniel Miller, who is a professor of anthropology at University College London at the Department of Anthropology. Hi. Well, good evening, as it were, from here, because we're, we're <laughs> yeah. 10 o'clock in the evening. Yeah, exactly. Um, we yeah. are actually based in uh, Tom's office at the Department of Sociology, uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, for me, it's it's really interesting uh, coming here really to help uh, promote the books, particularly yeah. to Chinese um, audiences and universities here. Um, but also we're using this opportunity really to do something which uh, facilitates a global Week. So we, we fitted this time so we could meet to time zones of different parts of the world. Yeah, so we are uh, very delighted uh, to, to, that you could all join us uh, wherever you're watching. And speaking of time zones in different parts of the world, we should also mention that uh, Danny and Xin Yuan only uh, arrived in Hong Kong yesterday. Uh, so they're still in, uh, even, even though physically they're in this time zone, they're still in a completely different time zone. Uh, so they've stayed up very, very light, late uh, for us to do this uh, live event. So if we are, uh, <laughs> if as this, as this event goes on, if we kind of uh, uh, if we gradually fall asleep, we hope you will forgive us, but we'll do our very best uh, to stay awake uh, over the next hour. Uh, so just a couple of uh, kind of things to uh, make you aware of. Uh, for the first kind of uh, a few, a half of the of today's uh, event, we'll probably introduce uh, some of the books and the idea behind them and how they link to uh, the project as a whole. And we'll try and talk through uh, kind of what each of the books are trying to do and our hopes and ambitions with them and the key arguments that we've got in them. Uh, and uh, then in the second half of the uh, uh, event, uh, we're going to kind of turn it over to your questions. So um, already we've kind of been uh, blown away and uh, deeply uh, kind of moved uh, by the loads of interesting questions uh, that people have sent in. And obviously it speaks to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, people are interested in the topics that these books raise. Uh, so we'll try and get through as many of those as, you, as we possibly can. Uh, but if you'd like to to share uh, your question or maybe something we say uh, during the uh, discussion uh, kind of gets you interested, uh, then feel free to send them to my email address, uh, which is very old school is McDonald, so M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D at uh, H-K-U for Hong Kong University, H-K-U dot H-K. Uh, so uh, feel free to send us that or you can tweet uh, uh, my Twitter which is Anthrotom, uh, A-N-T-H-R-O-T-O-M. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, so I suppose uh, kind of if we want to get started, then uh, all of these books kind of came out of a project called the Why We Post project. So I think that's uh, a really important place to start. And maybe we could start by asking uh, Danny to give a, a quick introduction to the project. Okay, thank you, Tom. I mean, I'm absolutely delighted to be launching these two particular books, but as you can see, there's, there's three books actually here. And as well as the two we're launching tonight on China, um, the third book is called um, How the World Changed Social Media. And, uh, <laughs> these books and, are going to fall over yeah, by the end of the <laughs> um, And this was written by not only the three of us here, but actually it was collectively written by the whole team of nine. And I suspect many of you know about the project, so I'm just going to be very, very brief about it. But in essence, what happened was 
Um, we all hear all these things being said about social media, that, you know, I don't know, nobody understands what a friend is anymore, or it's changed our cognitive abilities. And as anthropologists, we basically sort of listened to this and said, well, hold on a minute, um, are these general trait statements true of uh, a factory worker in India or a farmer in, in China? Um, because they all use uh, social media. So we established a team of nine people, and unusually we were able to um, fund it so that all nine could carry out simultaneous 15-month ethnographies um, in sites all across the world, also Brazil, India, England, Italy, Turkey, Chile, uh, Trinidad, uh, etc. And then we were able to compare all our results. So it was a genuine exercise in collaborative, and comparative anthropology. And I say it went very well. And actually, we're producing uh, 11 books, and all of these books are free. So, when we say we're launching the book today, what it means is already you can go onto the uh, UCL press site and download uh, these books for free, and actually, several others that have already come out. And eventually, there will be all 11. Again, all open access, all free. Um, there's also a website. If you just Google Why We Post, you'll find 130 films um, that we produced and uh, lots of stories. And there's a, a MOOC uh, available on the platform uh, FutureLearn. Because we felt that this is a topic that just about everybody's interested in. And therefore, um, we wanted to make our results as accessible as possible. And in just one minute, I'll say that really there's two sides to this. One is, as you might expect from anthropologists, we were concerned to show that almost everything you might be interested in in terms of social media varies from site to site. But actually, um, whether it's education or politics uh, or media, it, it depends which particular site you're talking about. And we need in the future to try and bear um, this degree of variation in mind when talking about social media. But at the same time, we also try to produce uh, a lot of generalizations about things like the rise of visual, visual media and also theoretical ideas, like a definition of social media is what we call scalable sociality, or the theory of polymedia, or even an idea about humanity, which we call theory of attainment, to try and uh, theorize uh, the project as a whole. So you've got all the, the differences, the cultural relativism, if you like and also all the generalisations and theories that come out. Um, but today, we're focusing on two sites. And I think the, the really key thing for, for us today is that um, it's the only country, China, where we have two studies. And the reason that's particularly valuable is because it's very easy when you have sites in the parts of the world to actually start characterising things as, oh, this is the Brazilian way, or this is the Trinidadian way. And to generalize about China is kind of crazy, right? It's, it's a vast place. It's the biggest population in the world. And actually, what these two books do, amongst many other things, is really um, help challenge almost every generalization you have ever heard um, under the word Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, if you can really look at the two books together, it's a great exercise in really giving yourself a sense of the breadth and diversity that was within um, one particular region. However, hopefully that comes out actually quite clearly when the authors themselves uh, describe something about what is actually contained in the books. So I'm going to turn to them in turn um, to give at least a brief summary um, of what you can expect to read about um, if, as we hope you will, um, start reading these books. So, Xinyuan? So, it's funny. Um, to start with, um, basically, um, my book is here, um, and the main argument is about, um, because the first the social context of my individual project is about the Chinese rural migrants. And I don't know what, how much you know about it, but briefly, um, China nowadays witnessed the biggest migration in human history. Over 250 million Chinese peasants they left their rural village uh, to a village home village to the cities and factories. But they also called floating population because of the household registration system. They can't really settle down in cities or those factory towns. So basically, they move from one place to another. 
elements like floating. So the reason I want to study them at the beginning because uh, you know like the social media you like uh, tra transcend the physical distance and you can keep contact with your family members left behind. So I kind of assume that okay those kind of population they may rely on social media the most because that help them to, to have, have some belonging to a group of people. But then Let's come to the main argument because the main argument is actually the, the big surprise for me because after 50 months doing the field work on the massive factories, making friends with like hundreds of factory workers, I realized that what I assumed about the use of social media among this particular population is turned out to, to be wrong because they use social media for different purposes and different ways and social media actually serve uh, in, in a play a very essential role in their daily life so um, because the majority of these new uh, these factory workers they are very young they, they drop to school like at age of 15 or 16 and for them the migration is not under the economic pressure that you need to earn money to support the family because actually their parents or even grandparents already work in the factories for them the migration itself is to help them to develop themselves to become modern citizen so the way they use social media is rather than like keep contact with their history that the past they, they try actually they intentionally cut off that Side because they think that's backwards and they don't want to mention their rural background. They use social media to collect those uh, fantastic, funky, uh, interesting photos online and post on their social media profiles. Well, I can't show photos here, but actually you can see a lot of like a screenshot of what people post on their social media and that's totally surprise you because there's nothing to do with their offline life um, they have all the online i call it uh, fantasy world and actually that is shows about their aspirations towards modernity so social media for them is uh, is a way to create to craft uh, a modern china which they they're looking forward to living in the future so the key argument of the book is actually i'm studying two like the dual migration one is from rural to urban and the other one is from offline to online and uh, to be honest and surprisingly actually the the latter uh, migration it turned out to be very if effective and really allow them to to achieve their aspiration so i would just like um, and i have here also on the list of like why people should read it well <laughs> obviously it's free knowledge <laughs> it's like uh, it's a free knowledge but uh, to be honest, uh, seriously um i think um i think this book by doing this research i i keep telling people that doing food work in this massive factory town and knowing factory workers actually also grow myself. I'm native uh, Chinese, I am a native speaker and I actually uh, live not too far away from my food side. But then after the research I realized actually I don't know China. I don't really know the, uh, the, the modern China through these factory workers eyes. So if that surprised me, I hope like if you have some, some stereotype about modern China, this book probably will debunk all the stereotypes you hold about China, about people's relation to education. Those people, they actually don't care about formal education. They use social media as a way of education. And like privacy, like whether it's like uh, the threat to privacy or for these people is actually an increased experience of privacy. So all the kind of arguments um, surprised me first during field work and I, I, I recorded it in the book so see whether uh, it will update some idea about China. I just add one more thing. Um, Kino hasn't mentioned he's a really, really fine artist in, <laughs> in terms of uh, traditional um, forms of Chinese painting and she adapted her skills yeah. Um, to actually document a lot of her field work and inside the book as well as yeah. a lot of other visuals because um, in all our books we try not to talk about social media but to write at least one chapter which concentrates on the actual visuals that people post um, you also have quite a few of her paintings yeah. um, which are fantastically uh, good at, at kind of portraying um, the particular sort of scenes and they're very kind of atmospheric and evocative yeah um, that's kind of like um 
uh, traditional paintings are used to either record the, some personal stories or the way I did food work. So uh, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, how to say, it's like a delightful journey, and I hope that I will, I will deliver the same experience as much as possible to you. And by, so that's the reason I, I hope I won't uh, uh, like. I hope I will live up to your expectations. Oh, <laughs> great, great. Yeah. Okay. okay, I cool. think it's Thank cool. you very much, Xinyuan. And I think actually uh, that's a really good point because uh, just following on from your, uh, you know, these beautiful paintings and you also spoke a, a little bit about the fact that you'd included lots of uh, uh, um, screen grabs and images of the actual kinds of photos and memes that people are posting online. So I, I think that before I introduce my book, I think that's a really nice point to kind of, uh, to kind of just make the point. I think, um, especially in the China case, um, we really grappled with the fact that um, we wanted to write books that were um, easy for people to read uh, and, and kind of uh, because, because actually uh, 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 Chinese social media is maybe uh, uh, um, understood very little uh, in uh, outside of China uh, you know in the rest of the world so um, we really wanted to kind of uh, write books that would not only you know do a good job of introducing what are the important platforms that people use you know what are the main kind of uh, services of Chinese social media and, and what are the main functions on those things but then to go a bit deeper and say okay these are the things that you know people talk about but actually how do normal people in China use them so you know people who work in a factory or people who work in a village so I think that that's one thing that we were quite passionate about when we tried to put these books together is to think of ways of um, just, just describing and doing a good job of introducing uh, these technologies um, themselves, but then uh, trying to explain them in a social light. So it's been a, that's been a difficult balance to strike, yeah. uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we've done an okay job on it. Uh, so I'll just introduce uh, really quickly uh, my book, uh, The Yellow One, uh, which is called Social Media in Rural China. So uh, for my work, uh, it was slightly different uh, to Xin Yu and I was in a different field site in a completely different province uh, from Xin Yu in fact, over a thousand kilometers away from Xin Yu And I was uh, in a small rural town. Uh, so the town had a population of around 6,000 people and the township had a population of 30,000 people. So that is, in by Chinese standards, this is as small a town as you could get. Uh, and I lived there for uh, 15 uh, months, a uh, uh, similar time to Xin Yuan. And uh, uh, during the time, I tried to understand everything that people were doing and kind of get involved uh, with uh, life in the villages and the town. Um, and really the main central argument to the book uh, looks at two sets of uh, different social relationships that people juxtapose, that they lay against each other on uh, Chinese social media platforms. So um, the first one is relationships with uh, people they know quite well. So it's the traditional kinds of relationships like um, uh, your kind of classmates or people who uh, work in the same employer as you or people from the same village as you or people from your family. So these are kind of quite uh, traditional relationships that are normally based on kinship. So blood relations or marriage or they're based on um, uh, uh, familiarity through these kind of formal institutions. Uh, but then uh, the other side of what happened was when I got to know people kind of really quite well, uh, eventually they started telling me all this interesting stuff about the fact that, oh, you know, I've got this stranger that I met online and I, you know, tell him all the, the everything that, you know, about what's on my chest or, you know, I'm date, I, you know, I, I, I've met this person and I want to go on a date with them. They're from the nearby city. I met them online. So, you know, slowly all these stories started coming out and I realised that actually there was a really important uh, juxtaposition here. So on the one hand, people were telling me I just use it for these kind of relationships. But on the other hand, s soon they kind of secretly started telling me about these almost experimentation uh, with uh, different kinds of relationships uh, with uh, people that they kind of uh, met 
through the internet. So really kind of the, the, the central uh, uh, area of my study just looks at uh, you know, the, the, this kind of balance that people are creating on their social media. So, you know, they're the ones who are choosing this. Um, and really what I try to do is try to weigh up what this means in terms of how people understand uh, the morality of these platforms uh, and also how they understand um, themselves, uh, even though they see themselves as rural people, uh, you know, they're deeply aware of uh, the connections that they have with the city uh, they're deeply aware of what's going on in uh, Beijing and Shanghai and other places. Uh, so really the whole book is kind of oriented around uh, this kind of balance. So uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I hope that people can uh, read uh, the books. And uh, I suppose it's a nice thing to say that, uh, you know, the, as Danny said before, um, uh, you know, we, we tend to generalize about places. And these two books, uh, I think, really nicely, uh, if you read them in tandem, uh, they kind of uh, s show how difficult it is to generalise uh, about a place like China. I mean, if I can just add one more thing to that, I think that um, it's also important in our project as a whole, because the, although we have uh, nine sites in the Why We Post project, um, seven of them tend to basically use the same platform. So you're going to have Facebook, you're going to have Twitter and Instagram and so forth. So obviously it makes almost like a kind of experiment um, in terms of the issue about generalising about social media across the world if you have at least one region that actually uses completely different platforms where it's kind of WeChat and QQ and, 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 and they're not getting access to the platforms that are familiar in other countries. And actually, for example, in our comparative book, we, we do quite a lot um, with this uh, differentiation because of, partly it's kind of like how much of this is because aspects of Chinese culture and Chinese history and Chinese society, how much is to do with the fact that there are actually completely different platforms um, and a different set of structures around social media going on um, and how far does what's going on in China parallel elsewhere. So I think the Chinese case is particularly interesting because nothing to do with us, it's simply the fact that um, as it happens, uh, if you look at social media as a global phenomenon in the way we're trying to do, um, China represents this very special case of different platforms. Um, and I should say that as w if in reading the book um, you weren't entirely clear, for example, as to you know, how do these platforms look and how do people use them, um, we have a lot of other forms of dissemination in this project. So uh, if you just Google why we post, um, you can come onto our website and there you will find films made by uh, Tom and Julian, which um, uh, on YouTube, which make very clear uh, how actually people use these sites. And there are other films uh, which demonstrate different aspects. I mean, Tom has made some, some wonderful films um, about uh, all sorts of different elements of, of usage. I think we're going to see, is it Photo Friends? We're going to, no, yeah, uh, I think. All and uh, etc. And Shin Yuan did a, a lovely film about um, using her paintings to show the methodology um, involved. So as well as looking at the books, we'd encourage you to go on the website and then you get to see uh, the films that can't be in the books themselves, but in a sense complement um, the books themselves. Yeah, so in fact, I think uh, that would be a really good uh, moment uh, to show you uh, just one of those films uh, to give you a flavour of uh, some of the people uh, who uh, inspired us uh, to write uh, this book.比较喜欢NBA吗？上面，然后喜欢NBA的各种巨星什么，麦迪、科比之类的。然后这上面都有，这上面电脑上NBA呃蒙日队上面有很多的明星。然后你把他们可以都买到自己的手下，当做自己的
，第一是他是，嗯，你必须要付出自己的努力，然后去出汗，要运动，然后拼搏，然后这些精神你都必须要有，而且要有团队精神。但是在电脑上，这些你只是当做一个总经理去买卖球员，然后剩下只是电脑系统的做出一些安排。然后我觉得在现实生活中打篮球更比较爽一些，比较嗨一些。Okay, so hopefully、uh, that gives you an idea of、uh, just one of the participants from、uh, my rural Chinese field site. Uh, and it's I, for, for me that's like quite a fun little video、uh, because it gives you a feeling of how um, uh, uh, you know、uh, in on、uh, social media in、uh, Chinese social media platforms、uh, you know there are all these games that are designed around getting you to accumulate levels and accumulate points、um, but really interestingly. Uh, the young man in the video、uh, kind of comes up with his own、uh, little way、uh, to kind of sidestep、uh, the bureaucracy of the system、uh, and to get his own kind of、uh, way to kind of、uh, just slowly move up uh, through uh, the levels on the system.、Um, so uh, we're going to move on.、Uh, so、uh, all those videos, as Danny said, are on the、uh, uh, Why We Post YouTube channel.、Uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, to、uh, try and answer some of the、uh, fantastic questions、uh, that、uh, some of you have sent in uh, uh, in relation to the books.、Uh, so if you still want to send a question in, it's、uh, McDonald M C D O N A L D at H K U dot H K. Right. Okay. So I'm going to actually、um, ask the questions and actually simply follow the order in which the questions originally came in. So our very first question、um, came from、uh, George Gur, and the question is: To what extent has the widespread use of social media redefined friendship in China? Well, I really like the question. I really want to answer. The We can both answer. <laughs> yeah, so you you may start, Xinyu. Okay, so I was like,、yeah, it's because I I do have like relate to the question, and that's actually one of the main. Topic in in my book because just、um, I mentioned before for those like rural migrants, social media has kind of opened the window for them to explore the kind of modern relationship and actually friendship is is actually a modern concept because for people living like rural village, I'm、mm. just imagine like traditional Chinese rural village when everybody know everybody, and it's actually there's no that kind of like space a lot of space for the Development of those friendship based on common interests, or there's no no kinship things. So in their village, they most of the relationship is like kinship and、um, uh, people from the same village. But for them, they have a very strong awareness that become modern is like you know people everywhere. You have lo lots of friends. So whenever I ask them how many friends you you have on your QQ and、uh, other social media, they always the typical answer is, oh, I can't even count that. Like、uh, thousands, maybe like hundreds. So for them, it's a, it's a, it's like a new chance to develop the things which only、uh, happens after the migration. So、uh, rather than say like、uh, the, as the questions that we define, actually in my case is like discover, discover the、uh, friendship, and they talk to to people、um, uh, online and、uh, not necessarily to be somebody they know. And actually, I think in Tom's view side,、uh, even in the rural China.、Uh, You also see the similar similar phenomena, right? Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And I think actually the, the again, I love the question, and I think one thing that was really interesting about it. So thanks, George. But one thing I thought that was you know it really made me think of is actually in my field site,、uh, one of the big things that、uh, is kind of central to people's online、uh, life. Um, is actually their classmates, so the people in their class in school, and most particularly,、uh, as well as the people from the year, the people from their class group. So,、uh, the small town where I lived in, it only had a middle school and、uh, some elementary schools, some primary schools. So, actually, after people got 
past high school, they had to go to a uh, nearby county town in order to keep attending school. Um, and one of the things when I kind of uh, started talking to these uh, young middle school students, one thing that came re out really centrally was that actually uh, they have these QQ. So QQ is the most popular social media platform in the town where I did my research. They have these things called QQ groups. Uh, which are small groups of uh, contacts that they send uh, asynchronous messages. So it's a bit like a, a kind of WhatsApp kind of discussion that goes on. Um, but those groups are almost always, or the, for young people, the most popular groups that are used most commonly are based on class groups, are based on uh, groups of uh, the, the, the form or the class at school. Uh, and what was really interesting is actually um, uh, for young people in the village, that uh, that group extended. Uh, so before they'd have only met all their classmates at school, uh, but now it's extended it into the evening and into the weekends. So actually, what happened was, uh, you know, there were lots of times when I was at people's homes at nine p.m. at night, and the students were trying to do their homework, uh, and they would go on to the class group and they would be sending um, messages out to the whole of their. Uh, the rest of their class saying, what's the answer to number seven? Or question number seven, what's the answer to number question number eight? Uh, so uh, for them, actually, uh, the class group became something that followed you around everywhere, even after you'd graduated. So I think that's quite a nice example of, uh, you know, almost uh, as well as having a, you know, a social media being a way to experiment with new kinds of friendship, let's say, or to, to, to look at different kinds of friendship. Here's examples where actually uh, familiar forms of friendship get entrenched or even intensified as a result of uh, social media. Thank you both. Um, our second question is from Lisa Lynn, and the question is, do you think social media has changed the way people conceive their life and relationships in modern China? What do you think of the digital gap in China? Wow. <laughs> Again, really big questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks, Lisa. I think I'll start with this one. So uh, for me, to just go back to that main argument uh, of the book, um, uh, for me, I think that, uh, uh, and to just develop it a little bit further, I said that uh, uh, one of the key things of social media uh, for the people that I, w I worked with was that it gave them the chance to uh, juxtapose their familiar friendships that I've been talking about with uh, kind of different uh, uh, forms of friendship that were, say, radically different uh, to what they uh, uh, had experienced before. Uh, but I think one of the things that's interesting about that is it would be quite easy to say that, oh, you know, uh, that's just allowing people to have a new form of friendship or to experiment with something different, uh, you know. Uh, but actually... Uh, I think people do this, uh, use this in different ways and in different kinds of uh, situations. So, uh, yes, certainly, you know, it helps to ease loneliness and it helps to, to do this. But another important thing, I think, is that uh, th these kind of relationships with strangers also help people to kind of uh, reflect upon themselves uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, Nowadays, if you know, if you're living in a village in China, as I said, you're kind of incredibly aware of what's going on in the rest of China, and it's not isolated or cut off in the village that I worked in. So you know, there's transport and kind of big roads being made and big construction projects. So actually, uh, I think by being able to have these relationships with uh, people uh, and maybe. Uh, do different things than they would in their normal sets of relationships and so maybe uh, start relationships with uh, comparatively less obligation to the ones they're used to. Uh, they're perhaps able to reflect a little bit more on <coughs> where they've come from and where their society is going, I think. And I think my contribution to the big question is um, on top of like what we just discussed, like the discovery of friendship, um, in one particular area is like very uh, traditional anthropology uh, requirement about kinship, and because of social media, I do uh, witness the way like people conceive the kinship, especially the senior family members' relationship to them. 
uh, they consider it differently because um, uh, again, uh, on Chinese social media it's very highly visual visualized, and you've got all the cute stickers and like and some of my implements that people um, answer my questions or I have handouts showed me that their conversation with their parents or even grandparents on WeChat or on QQ that uh, those senior family members used to be never smile to them and they're using those cute funky stickers and all of a sudden people realize that wow they're human beings they're just not grandpa like grandpa like very seniors old people but they can be very uh, interesting and that also allows Allow them to uh, get them to know the youth culture in China. So I definitely see, and especially with the, the popularity of smartphone, that where older generation they found it's more, uh, uh, it's they can use those social media via smartphone. So you see the change and the. Uh, the gap is like reduced because the use of social media and uh, I think the second question is about digital gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the age is, age is one of the digital Yeah, there's definitely and somehow. also the before when we're talking about digital gap is also talking about like whether you have access to the technology but in both of our studies we found that even like in the remote rural China people got wonderful internet and it's not like about the device uh, the, the gap but the interesting thing, or I found it's quite uh, uh, interesting, is even so people using the same social media, but they use it so differently. Because I spent one month in Shanghai, the big city, and people like always mention as modern China, try to compare the use of social media. And what I found is like, I, I did a, a little bit like a quantitative like survey, and I followed like thousands of uh, postings by Shanghai people in Shanghai and people in this factory town. And I compare whether there's some overlap that like we assume that on social media you can share everything. There's no boundary, and actually it turned out like uh, around four thousand postings, only zero point zero three percent is similar. So actually online, it's not like oh you have social media we share everything. The divide is already existed. You see the divide, the huge divide between the middle class and those rural migrants. It's not like because they can't do that because like the. the the, the information share is actually still kind of like in, in group thing. So it's made the digital gap more complicated in that mm. way. So it's not about technology now, it's about the way people use it or whether you use with email or whether you use the uh, in internet for gain information. So that's about the daily life use. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also, uh, you know, it's, I think, it, again, it speaks to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we would assume that um, uh, uh, people in rural China or people who are factory workers are uh, uh, the have-nots, uh, so that they, they have uh, no uh, social media. But, of course, uh, you know, the reality in today's China is, um, uh, as Xin Yuan said, uh, I think far more complicated. And uh, just to add a, a kind of little uh, uh, extra thing uh, to that, I remember when I started my field work, every, everybody in Beijing said, why are you going to go to the countryside to do a, a project? Because no one will use social media there. So, I mean, yeah, I was always struck by the fact that even people who lived in the city in Beijing were kind of thought that this was... Um, uh, you know, an absolutely crazy, <laughs> an absolutely crazy thing to do, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, it speaks to the fact that actually uh, going out there and uh, seeing what where gaps do actually exist, uh, uh, you know, is a really important thing. Uh, and uh, I just add that because we have to move on, but like I just add that actually, um, there are uh, 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 and perhaps another reason why these books are important. Is there actually relatively few uh, studies of uh, social media, especially in rural China? Uh, you know, and uh, you know, even Xin Yuan's book is uh, adds to uh, you know a, a small number of great studies that have already been done on uh, industrial uh, migrant workers in in China. But I think it it takes it to a different level because of the kinds of ethnographic uh, uh, techniques she's uh, used and that her kind of uh, the, the long period of time she spent with uh, the migrants. Thank you.
Okay, so we have a question number three, yes. I don't know how many we're going to get through. Um, it's from uh, Feridun Nizam, who's an assistant professor at a state university in Turkey. Um, and he mentions that he studies particularly um, issues of media laws. And he was simply asking, um, can you tell us something about the media laws in China, and particularly any that pertain to uh, social media? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, again, it's a fantastic question. Uh, there are, you know, an incredible uh, amount of laws uh, in, in China that govern the internet. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to point out that even though we're kind of uh, scholars of the Chinese internet, uh, there are many scholars looking at different levels. So everything from the .cn domain name is governed by, governed by regulations and legal instruments, uh, all the way down to kind of uh, using internet cafes or uh, signing up for your kind of broadband connection in China or your uh, or your kind of uh, you know your cell phone contract you know they're all linked uh, and governed by legal things so there are far too far too many laws uh, for us to possibly kind of cover uh, sadly in this question uh, but perhaps one way to answer it is actually to say how uh, our participants experience a new law so um, even though we perhaps don't know that much about the internet law, uh, you know, I was struck by the fact that my participants perhaps knew even less. So, <laughs> so a lot of the time when I spoke to the people in my village uh, about things like uh, state control of the internet, or let's say censorship of the internet, they actually didn't know that much about it. Uh, uh, you know, very few people knew that um, uh, the Chinese internet had this a uh, great for firewall of China that stops people accessing uh, foreign websites uh, and uh, you know people tended to kind of have a more uh, mundane view of the internet and they said well actually online now uh, you know most of the time I just share happy things anyway share baby photos or like you know pictures of my marriage and wedding dress or whatever so uh, for, for a large group of people you know that wasn't particularly important uh, or it wasn't something they expressed a great deal of concern but on the other hand I saw some interesting things and you know um, there's a great idiom uh, in China like uh, uh, so there are rules at the top, there's laws on the top and on the bottom there is uh, countermeasures or kind of responses to the laws. So a good example of this is um, in China to use an internet cafe you have to be 18 years old and you prove that using your national ID card which you use to access the internet cafe. Um, but it was really interesting because uh, there was a kind of, uh, uh, if you didn't have an ID card, uh, it was possible to borrow one in order to uh, allow yourself to access the Internet Cafe. So these are examples of uh, uh, little everyday things that come out of ethnography where you realise kind of how, where you realise how people uh, interpret or ignore or are a bit oblivious to the rules and regulations uh, that kind of govern uh, the, the use of the internet. Yeah, I just think, follow Tom, I think you just like leave the question to, to the way I also want to answer it. Because uh, by law, of course, is the, 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 the default meaning that is guide people what you should do, what you shouldn't do. But funny enough, the, the formal law, as Tom just mentioned, is actually basically ignored by people. And I know that where the question comes from, I, I kind of assume that people care about the censorship and whether like political participation. But in my book, like the one uh, chapter actually uh, devoted to that uh, topic, like why in daily life, ordinary Chinese, they actually don't really care about the censorship because the most content that comes online is not about like active, like a political or against anything. It's about their daily life. It's about the, the social relations. And the other layer of understanding law is like, actually, what is the most effect law in people's use of social media is come from their social uh, relationship. That kind of law guide them how to use and they have a very, very strong awareness like, oh, who should see that and who shouldn't see that. And then it's like normativity, we call it. It's like these social norms actually a much, much stronger law for them in terms of this social media. So that, that is like the, my understanding, like how people conceive the kind of law of social media. Thanks. Thank you. Um, question number four comes from uh, Wong 
Ine, and Ine. Ine. <laughs> <laughs> trying to pronounce that. it right. Wang uh, Wang Wang. How do you define Chinese online identity? Yeah, I think the question is the way you put the question is kind of I see it's like I see this offline identity and online identity and I know there's like a long debate about whether online you're more authentic or you you losing your humanity or you are a different person. I mean, in my particular case, uh, it's probably like radical population as I just mentioned that because they have like big dream to to become to join the part of the. Uh, modern China thing, but uh, actually they kind of stuck in factories and it's a long way to go to really achieve like those modern life So they post a lot of like online online those uh, fantasy photos But um, but funny enough like when talking about online identity um, A lot of factory workers they confess to me or uh, tell me the truth that they actually prefer their online uh, identity in a way that because they won't be judged by others uh, because they're low income or their education background some of some of them talk to strangers because they they like you because who you are not because you're rich or you can give them job so online relationship turn out to be more authentic or using their words the pure those kind of social relations and th that is like in a way we we look into the online offline identity and that's already become the essential part of the people's like overall identity and how they see themselves as Tom also mentioned. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to say anything else? No, I think we should. Let me go and think back. Well, I, I might have a go at um, Our next question is from Priscilla Song and there's a dual question. The first one actually is really more sort of technical. Um, she's really asking when um, these books uh, would be available to students and um, and the answer is they are already now. available as now. of today. <laughs> um, these books, are, as we mentioned before, they are free, they are online. Um, it's great that actually um, the, the, the new digital possibilities means, for example, we have lots of colour illustrations. You can hypertext, hi, hyperlink between the, um, the footnotes and, and the bits they refer to. Um, and it's really, we think, in many ways, the future of books, we hope, will be like this. So they're available, and we strongly encourage you um, to uh, use it in any way you like in respect to teaching and similarly with the various films, etc. You can make your own package. Um, you know, so you could like look for a section on a particular topic, like on privacy or on education, uh, or in any particular area, and um, it would be great um, to see these used because there is so much written about social media, but not much of it informed by this kind of research. That leads really the second part of the question. Um, he's also asked. Oh, well, we should add uh, an enormous thanks to uh, UCL Press, who are the first yeah. fully open access oh, yeah. uh, press in the UK. Uh, who are the publishers of these books, uh, University Press. Um, the second part is, is the question people often ask about ethnographic research is, well, you know, you just, you didn't actually study China, yeah. you didn't study Chinese migrant workers, you studied one particular factory and you studied one particular town. So how actually can you generalise or theorise well, that area yeah. um, uh, on the basis of, of this kind of studies? And I think the, the answer to that was, I'll answer it it's not particular to do with China, it's to do with all kind of all kinds of ethnographic research, yeah. is I think that you have to recognise that any kind of social science research, there is a spectrum um, between uh, the diversity of, of peoples and what you observe and the generalisations and the theories. Because even in respect to the field site, you could say, well, how can you generalise? Because mm. women are different from men. Yeah. Uh, older women are different from younger women. Richer, older women are different from poorer, older women. And of that section of uh, richer, older women, um, this person was completely different from that person. And you can go on and on and on until logically, um, even that person this year is different from the way they were next month. So at one level, there is no such thing as generalisation at all. Everybody is unique. Every observation you make is completely unique. And we actually don't want to lose that because we're very concerned with the humanity of the people we deal with. And one of the reasons our books often contain stories is we want to make sure that when you're talking about generalisations, don't miss that every one of these people is a unique individual, often doing creative things that you never saw anybody else do at all.
Um, and we think it's very important to hold on to that humanity, which is in denial of generalization. But at the same time, as long as you keep this in mind, it is possible um, to make generalities. So you can say things like, oh, um, social media has changed the nature of human communication because it used to be more oral and used to be more textual, but actually it's increasingly visual. And these people use uh, visual images, memes and other things to, um, to convey uh, thing, uh, you know, their values or their feelings yeah. in ways that probably wasn't uh, possible, at least common before. Yeah. And that's a generalization. And equally, we have our definition of, of social media and scalable sociality and uh, many other generalizations that we make, not only across China, but across um, all the nine sites that we deal with. And the point really is that these are not in contradiction. That is to say, um, each generalization has a series of kind of levels. So I said, make this big generalization about visual media, and then you can say, oh, and now uh, we have memes in all the sites, or yeah. people take selfies in all the sites. But then uh, you say, well, okay, but actually in each place, they take different kinds of selfies, and those have meaning only in the particular local context. And one of the things we said very early on was that actually we're delighted to have two sites in China because in many ways this contrast with generalizations made about the Chinese as though this vast population um, was all the same. So the answer to the question is not to actually be afraid of either end of the spectrum, but to actually acknowledge that all social science depends on that acknowledgement, that there are generalizations but you always have to remember that underneath these generalizations are all the different degrees of variation, not just to the individual field site, but right down to the individual person. And if you bear that in mind, you can actually be true um, to the evidence that we find from all our sites. And one of the, the key points here would be, uh, okay, this book, <laughs> I'll give you that, um, which is uh, How Well Change Social Media, because this is the book where we compare across the nine sites and try and talk in general terms about topics like gender and politics and education um, and use the comparative dimension. And I think, right. uh, sorry, I just actually, I just wanted to add a little thing and I think uh, to go back to, I think one of the really uh, fun uh, things about this project that I feel has been an incredible challenge and we've tried to do as well as we can is to marry, uh, say, things like uh, the films with our website that allows you to browse some of the discoveries of things. Uh, and also, uh, you know, our, our, we have a free online course that you can do uh, to learn more about it. So uh, also there is a level where, um, uh, you know, as you get down and hopefully if you know you get uh, the chance to read a book uh, obviously the form of a book allows you to talk more about the caveats and the exceptions and uh, you know the, the complexities of making a generalization so uh, we hope that uh, through the kind of different kinds of dissemination we've done that uh, people can navigate their way uh, down through levels of kind of uh, complexity and levels of detail uh, as they would like to. Okay, so we're now in about five minutes left. And there's lots more Sorry. questions. So I think, as often happens in kind of seminar situations, I'm going to just go through these questions relatively quickly mm -hmm. and ask you to just give more like a sentence or two okay, um, yeah. in, in answer. answer. Limit your yeah. answer to a sentence or two and let's try and get to at least another three or four questions if sure. we can. Okay. So um, the next question is from uh, Yi Xu Lin, and it is, what do you see as the unanswered questions after the search project about social media in China? Oh, loads of. That's my <laughs> short answer. <laughs> she answers loads. Uh, for me, one of the biggest unanswered questions is, uh, uh, just as I was leaving the field site, uh, WeChat was becoming really popular, uh, and uh, people in rural China were starting to use it a lot more. Uh, and uh, using things like uh, mobile money and using WeChat payment systems. Uh, so I've actually just started a new project uh, looking at these kind of uh, methods of payment. So that's one. And actually on the same term, in terms of um, one of the answers to this is, you know, what future research do you intend to do? Yeah. And the, we have a plan to create a new project similar to this. 
Um, but we're moving from social media to um, smartphones because we think that encompasses even more these days than social media does. Yeah. We're moving to looking more at aging um, because in some ways it's only very recently that usage has crept up to older people and this is something like unprecedented if we want to explore that. We also want to look at um, the rise of apps um, and see how they uh, change people's welfare, things like mHealth and, and other health related apps. So there's a whole lot of new questions that we want to explore um, through future research and build on the project we have here. Um, and the, the next question uh, from Gaida um, al is, can you share your experience of writing, presenting the data? Writing it was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long, uh, somebody actually asked how long did it take, so uh, we actually left the field site two years ago, uh, almost exactly, yeah. Uh, I think that's right, yeah, yeah. 2014. Wow, so uh, it's taken uh, a while and uh, kind of, uh, as we mentioned before, I think uh, UCL Press have kind of guided us uh, and gave us, uh, we've had a lot of kind of uh, great reviewers for helping us, uh, you know, improve our books. And uh, within a team, we've kind of commented and, and, and kind of worked on improving each other's books. So it's been a journey. I mean, let me just add one thing, though, which is that um, what's special, maybe, I think, about the experience of writing and presenting the data in our case is that it's a team. Mm. I yeah. mean, most people write their things up in isolation. And um, we've kept it collaborative and comparative all the way through. So actually, if you look at these books, they have the same chapter headings. And we do that very deliberately. So chapter three, for example, is all about the visuals of the post. And chapter four tends to be more about family. Yeah. Partly because by doing that, it really um, demonstrates how different each site is. But it meant that even when you were doing the field work, or when you were writing, or when we were preparing things like this, um, you always have in mind the fact that you've got all these other people who had these different findings, and that alerts you to what's specific about your own site, and also what then needs explaining about what you found in your own site. And I think we've really enjoyed having that comparative. It's also more fun with yeah. a team, yeah. and we can talk to each other about what's going on. Um, but I think it really added uh, something special to the whole process of research and writing, is having um, a team working in this kind of collaborative and comparative uh, manner. And uh, I think for me, some uh, more like some actual personal uh, experience of presenting the data is like um, we have like some standard survey, and uh, we have like it, one member of the team uh, he is like an uh, expert in uh, statistics, so he got all the beautiful data. But then we'd think, oh, we're seeing social media, and it's like social media is so visual. So I kind of use like the, the software to produce some like infographics. And that actually, um, uh, this book, and uh, so this, those kind of uh, uh, infographics. So we try to present our way also in a highly visual way, and it's quite fun to produce this like a visual, how colorful data. Final question I think we've got time for, and you've got like a sentence each, is from Yu Gan Mei, and it is what do you think of the particularities in terms of social media use in the Chinese countryside? Are well, there evident differences oh, between nice. village people and urban people? Oh. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what are the particularities? Um, uh, so uh, I suppose one of the kind of uh, main things is uh, during my field work, and I'm, sh I'm almost certain the situation has changed now, but at the time when I was uh, working, people there were using uh, QQ. Uh, largely, uh, so there was a, 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 a people that in urban China used uh, WeChat. Uh, so if they migrated away uh, uh, and then came back, uh, they would kind of bring WeChat with them. But I'm sure that's kind of undergone change. Uh, and maybe just the second thing is just that people are uh, because it's such a small place. Uh, people are incredibly conscious of what other people might think of what they post online. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of pe the things people post in their public uh, profile pages, uh, you know, people are really conscious of it. So, I think that's uh, probably a big, yeah. a big thing. But there's far too much detail uh, to, <laughs> to describe uh, in a minute. Uh, so in that case, I think very finally, I will say on behalf of, as it were, the two visitors here, Julian and myself, uh, many thanks to Tom, who basically uh, c conceived of 
and facilitated um, this online yeah. launch of two wonderful books. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both for joining. And I think uh, also uh, thanks to all of you uh, for joining. Uh, there's a few other thanks. Uh, we must thank uh, uh, Hong Kong University uh, Sociology for hosting the event. Uh, also UCL Anthropology for hosting the project. Uh, and uh, the yeah, European yeah, Research exactly. Council, uh, most, yeah. impo most, most <laughs> importantly, for kind that. of uh, making uh, the project happen. Thank you for YouTube for hosting so many good videos that, you know, my days are gone. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, thank you once again to you all. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy the book and we hope that uh, if you do or if you have questions about it, uh, you'll contact any of us uh, and continue uh, the discussion. So thank you for tuning in you. and uh, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.